to let you know that the two studies we're going to be talking about today, first of all, I'm going to talk uh, a bit about the review that we've written with the NSPCC, um, that's reviewing the evidence about mental health for looked after children. And then in the second half of the session, Helen Drew from the University of Sussex is going to be talking about uh, some work she's been doing with the virtual schools. Um, and we'll maybe ask you a bit about what you know about virtual schools, first of all, for that. Okay. So, first of all, this is the study that uh, I'm going to talk about, the review of what works in preventing and treating poor mental health in looked after children. Um, it's something that uh, we wrote here at the Reef Centre, uh, commissioned by the NSPCC, and the full report is available as a free-to-download PDF, both on the NSPCC website and the Reef Centre website, so you can follow either of these links to get the report. We do have an executive summary as well if you don't want to go through the whole report, which picks out the key messages. So I'm just going to go into some of those key messages today. Um, I can see that uh, from the information here that Joe is a clinical uh, psychologist. Also, we've got Alan Reese joining us today, who does work with the virtual schools. Um, Vanya Pintu, who's a, a research student here at the Reese Centre and is also a psychologist. I'm just wondering the others of you joining us, can you just let us know through the chat box what role you see yourself in? So whether you're foster carers or social workers or you work with schools, just so we can get an idea of who we've got joining us today. Hi, Emily. Okay, great. So you're joining us from uh, NCB today, looking at children's and young people's health and well-being. That's fantastic. So directly relevant to the work that we've been doing here. And anyone else uh, let us know? Okay, brilliant. Education consultant and fostering panel member. Okay, so something of what we're going to say about ordinary care in a moment will be certainly relevant to your work there as well. Okay, great. So we've got a, a bit of a mix of people joining us today. And that's just going to help us pitch what we're, uh, what we're actually talking about in the session. Okay, so first of all, I think probably most of you are aware that um, children who are in care, children and young people, are at increased risk of mental health issues. The last major study that was done on this was back in 2003, so we're probably well overdue uh, something looking at prevalence of mental health issues, but certainly we know that looked after boys and girls are more at risk of particular um, disorders, um, mostly around conduct disorders, so around um, difficult behaviour, which we know can be difficult for the young people as well as for the, the adults around them, and can be a reaction to various things, including the time that they've had before they came into the care system, but also the time that they have in the care system. We also know that if we ask various people around uh, the young person that there's quite good agreement on what's called externalising problems, so that's conduct disorders, behavioural issues, not quite such good um, agreement on the internalising disorders such as anxiety or depression, um, but again it's good to have the, uh, the point of view of a number of people around the young person and the young person themselves in order to identify any issues that might be going on. Okay, so just to let you know what we did um, in this review, it was the NSPCC were looking for a review of what works in terms of mental health interventions for looked after children. And the idea was that NSPCC in their work are working with a number of local authorities around the country um, and as I'm sure you know, there are a number of different interventions that are available for children and young people in general who have mental health issues. They wanted to know if these are evidenced as being of use to children who are in care, whether there are particular interventions that are more suitable than others, that are more likely to work, and perhaps who they are more likely to work with. So we wrote this report to actually look at how strong the evidence was for a range of different interventions. 
which was quite a complex piece of work in terms of trying to pin down what the interventions are, what they're aiming to do, and what the evidence is for their use with looked after children. So what we didn't do in terms of looking at interventions was look at how interventions have been used with young people in general. It was very much about how have they been used with children who are in care. We also wanted to look at the context in which the interventions operate. So we felt it was very important not to look at interventions in isolation and think of them just as something that is done to young people, but to think about what is the life of these young people, what are these, their experiences that might uh, interact with some of the procedures that are part of the interventions and might actually affect how, um, how much they are able to influence outcomes, so mental health, well-being, behavioural well-being as well. So we've come up with the concept of ordinary care, and what we're thinking about when we think of ordinary care is the day-to-day -day lives of children and young people who are in care. So what is it about their day-to-day -day experiences, their prior experience, that can be classed as an intervention in itself? Before we start thinking about paying for um, these kind of intensive interventions that are designed for one-to-one -one or group use with young people, what can we gain from getting the ordinary care right? And that's partly because we think that that can be an intervention in itself, but also that we think it's important to think about ordinary care as being the context within which interventions take part. And not every person who does an evaluation of an intervention will actually talk about ordinary care. So quite often we'll get papers that are writing up an evaluation of an intervention for mental health and well-being, and it will talk about exactly what the intervention was, how many weeks it took place, and uh, how many people took part, but they won't talk in great detail about who took part in it, what were their experiences in care, were they in foster care, were they in residential care, how old were they when they came into care? So a lot of that kind of contextual information is missing from these evaluation reports. So we think it's really important to think about those contextual issues. And we wanted to get your um, thoughts on this, really, before we go into talking about those specific interventions. So in your roles, um, we were just wondering, what sort of aspects of ordinary care, as I've described it there, do you think could influence young people's mental health? And which of them do you think in your role you can influence? So we've got that chat box there. If anyone wants to um, kick us off here and just think about what are the things about ordinary care, day-to-day -day life and care that might actually influence young people's mental health and whether or not you think that any of those are under your control. Joe, sure. yeah, so you've brought up a, a key point there, actually, which comes up quite often, which is about uh, contact, so contact with birth families. Um, definitely, if it's, if it's not managed particularly well, if it's not in the child's best interest, then it can definitely have a, a, an impact on mental health. And Joe, is that something that you feel you have influence over in your role? Okay, great. So you're in a position where you can provide the consultation to the social workers. That's great. Getting the uh, different aspects of the system to work together is, is certainly something that came out as being important in the review. Um, Alan's also brought up how birth parents are talked about by carers. And yeah, I think you're right that that is um, under control. Is, is making clear what the importance is of that, that it's not going to be a benefit to young people's mental health to have their identity, their, their birth family's identity actually um, denigrated by 
the way that foster carers or social workers or others around them talk about them. Anya, yes, yeah, that's a really good point as well. This kind of instability, this not knowing what's going to happen in the future. So whether, as you've put it there, a carer, carer is going to get rid of you, not knowing where you're going to be living at the end of the day, um, not knowing if you're going to have the same social worker. So there's a number of uh, issues that you've all brought up there that are shown in the evidence, certainly to influence young people's well-being. So it can be influenced by the child, certainly. Um, and then their motivation um, in terms of relating to other people um, and in terms of their feelings about themselves. It can also be related to the timing of interventions. Now, what we're not saying here is that every child who is having a difficult time at home should be whipped into care at the earliest possible opportunity. What we're saying is that if the correct decision for a child is to have a permanency option that is not staying at home with the birth family, then the sooner that decision is made, the better. And I'm sure that you would all agree that for any decision that's made about a child's placement, then it needs to be done in a timely manner. What doesn't, what really doesn't help young people is to have these decisions dragging on over months and years. So whether that decision is to support the birth family and, and help them to return home, or whether it is to support them through into a permanency option, or through into independent living. Um, any of those need to be timely decisions and they need to have that support around them. We all know that uh, whether the foster carer or the residential worker um, is warm, committed, has a good relationship with partner if they have one, basically what we think of as sensitive parenting. Those are all the things, the kind of uh, skills and attributes that we would hope that carers of young people would have. So there's something about the child as an individual, there's something about the, the carers as individuals. There's also very much to do with the interaction between the two of them. So you can have what looks like a fantastic match on paper, um, but it may be that the interaction between the two of them, for whatever reason, just doesn't work. Um, and uh, yeah, so as a couple of you have, have brought up here, we've got the idea of fairness, um, consistency and coherence. So all those kind of managing expectations within the relationship are important, and also the integration of the child into the home. So again, sense of fairness and equity. Um, so those should be things that are, are under some control, but it may be that you get a, a young person into a placement and it's not really working out. And in that case, maybe a placement move is not such a bad thing. Okay. And yes, as Anya says, the, the family values and expectations can vary hugely and it can be very difficult for a young person to know what are the rules about getting a glass of water, where you sit to eat your dinner, all those things which can make it very, very difficult. This idea of consistency um, can be hard. There is the role of the school as well, which Helen's going to talk more about in the second half of the session. Um, and then contact is something that you've already brought up. Okay, I'm not going to linger on this slide just uh, because I think it's more important for us to look at the interventions that have come up, but just to let you know that we did look at a range of assessment tools that are used with looked after children to look at their mental health and well-being. Um, the strengths and difficulties questionnaire is quite commonly used at the minute, and although it's not ideal in terms of giving a lot of great detail, I think it can offer a reasonable kind of general picture of well-being and might be good as something that local authorities can use as a kind of early indicator of any difficulties that young people might be having. Um, and indeed, that is what a number of local authorities are, are doing with it now. But there are certainly other measurement tools out there that will give a much more in-depth indication of young people's mental health. Again, though, we think the idea of the context here is important. So any mental health assess assessment that just gives a snapshot of the young person and doesn't take into account where they're living and their relationships with other people is not really going to tell you a lot about that young person and about what might work with them. Okay, in terms of the interventions we looked at, as I said before, we were only looking at interventions where someone had written a research report about how effective they'd been with a population of looked after children. 
This didn't have to just be in the UK, so we looked at papers worldwide, but we were uh, limiting ourselves to anything where there were at least two published papers on that intervention being used with looked after children. So there are probably about 100 other interventions where there's been one paper written and they're at very early stages of the evidence. Um, and we certainly welcome building of evidence on those interventions. We were looking at just outcomes for the children and young people, so not at adulthood outcomes. And we ended up with 106 studies. Um, some interventions have got quite a lot of evidence on them, and some of them only have a couple of papers on. There seems to be a mix of who these interventions are targeted at. Targeted at sorry. Um, in terms of the emotional well-being, so the kind of attachment needs of young people, a lot of those interventions are targeted directly at the child. If we think about behavioral well-being, so bearing in mind that conduct disorders are the, the most common difficulties that young people in care have, a lot of those interventions are targeted at the carer. So it's about carer training. Um, and that's something that we'd, we'd like you to think about really is, is whether targeting specifically the child or the carer or a mixture of both or other contexts as well, such as school, might be the best approach for um, working with young people in care. So I'm certainly not going to go through all of the interventions that we reviewed in the report, but just bringing up a few here. Um, Multidimensional Treatment Foster Care, MTFC. You may have heard of this one. It's been used in the UK now. There's been a, a large trial here. It's certainly got the largest amount of published evidence. The US results um, do seem to look very promising in terms of behavioral improvements. Um, the way that MTFC works, if you haven't come across it before, is it's an intensive fostering program with a team of professionals around the child, and it works on a system of rewards, so rewarding um, the desired behaviors. And certainly it seems to look from the US evidence um, that it's, it works in that way. Um, as research professionals, we're concerned with how that research is conducted. Um, and certainly one of the things that we would want to bear in mind is that most of that promising work from the US, um, the evidence has actually been produced by the same people who designed MTFC in the first place. So what you need is more kind of independent evaluations, uh, which have been conducted in Sweden and in the UK. So the UK tests um, have been done on a, a randomized basis and then a comparison basis. They do look a bit more mixed, certainly, than the US results. Um, one of the, the large scale tests that was done in the UK suggests that perhaps some of those benefits of MTFC might not last beyond the end of the MTFC placement. So MTFC is designed to be a short term intervention, usually somewhere between six to nine months. So there is this idea, which Arnie, you brought up before, about not knowing how long you're going to be there. Well, actually, a lot of these young people do know that they're not going to be in that placement for very long, and they know they're going to be moved on at the end of it. And certainly one interpretation of why the effects might not last in the UK trial is the knowledge that you're not going to be there at the end, but also the idea that if this is something which is targeting antisocial behavior, going back and being placed back away from your MTFC foster family and going back to your old neighborhood and your old peer group might be an explanation for why those effects don't last. Another key finding of the UK tests was that um, actually this might be a very beneficial uh, intervention for children who are highly antisocial at the start so if you have someone who does have real behavioral issues, actually MTFC might be very good for them. But for the young people who were put in MTFC placements and didn't have very strong behavioral issues, in fact, it was worse for them than other types of placements. So the children who were in other types of placements and didn't have behavioral issues at the start were better off. So really, that is getting us to think about when people are reporting evidence they have to be very clear about who these interventions are being trialed with and thinking about whether some of them work better with some populations of young people in young care than with others. 
So that I think the clearest example of that comes through MTFC. There are some other promising looking interventions out there. So ABC is attachment and biobehavioral catch up. Um, and again, this does look promising in terms of some of the indicators of attachment uh, issues that young people might have. So lower cortisol levels, which is associated with stress, um, less avoidant attachment behaviours. Again, now this has been tested largely by those who've developed it, and the follow-ups for this are quite short. So we found this quite pretty much across the board. A lot of the follow-ups, so looking at whether or not these any effects are lasting, are quite short. You really need to be following these children up for a number of years after they've taken part in the intervention to see if these are long-lasting effects. Um, and John, just noticing your comment there about MTFC. So, yes, yeah, certainly your local experience there um, seems to reflect the evidence that we have from the larger UK trial in terms of its effectiveness with antisocial children, more so than those who have uh, relationship issues. Um, there's also a, a program called Foster and Changes, which operates through carers. Um, it's a short-term 12-week training program. Again, that looks quite promising, and that's currently being rolled out, um, we believe, in Wales in a larger trial. Um, and great, okay, so we've got, again, some local evidence coming up here in the chat box about uh, reports of significantly positive outcomes and long-term effect, which is great to hear because actually, again, this is a, another intervention where at the moment there's not a lot of published research about the longer term effects, so we'll be interested in looking at that. And um, finally, I just wanted to draw out middle school success because Helen's going to be talking about schools in just a moment. Um, this is a, another one from the US that works with children and carers, and it's about getting them ready for the transition to a new school. Um, it works with them to set goals, to improve relationships, and to look at their problem solving skills. It certainly looked promising from the trials that have been done in terms of both internalizing and externalizing behaviors, um, but the trials so far have only been on about 50 girls in the US, so certainly they need to uh, have a much bigger and more robust trial on that. So as we say, there's certainly some promising interventions out there, and there are a number of other ones that are covered in the report, um, largely based around attachment theory and social learning theory. And we think it's better for um, these to be used in combination rather than just one or the other. Certainly what comes across in, in all cases is that it's not enough just to look at behaviour management. So even if behavioural issues seem to be the, the problem, if that's what you want to call it, um, if that's the difficulty that seems to be um, there with the young person's mental health, is that it's a behavioural issue, even then it's not enough just to tackle the behaviour, it is about developing the relationship between the child and their carers and the child and their peers, but also their understanding of themselves and the other person. It is important that they have consistency, so certainly in uh, the review that we do of mentoring in the report, um, there are studies that show that it's better to have no mentor at all than a mentor that you only see every now and again when they feel like it. So certainly consistency is important. And that one size doesn't fit all. So there will be some interventions that are suitable for some children and some that are really not. So they should have this flexibility to meet individual needs. Okay. So these are just a, a couple of questions that we want you to think about while uh, while Helen's preparing for her bit of the session. So how do you think we can ensure that intervention effects carry across context? So a lot of these interventions are designed for a particular placement or for a particular place. So they might be a, a relationship, all about the relationship with the carer, or they might be about preparedness for school. How can we actually make sure that those effects carry across to a new placement or from home to school? And then also, how can we improve the evidence? I think I can come up with a couple of suggestions for that improving the evidence, certainly in terms of having better designs for uh, some of these research studies, having clearer comparison groups, having more information about the young people who take part in these studies, and having longer follow-ups. 
and we think a really key thing is to get young people involved in helping to decide what some of the outcome measures are. So if we're thinking about whether or not an intervention has been successful, what do we actually mean by success? Okay, yeah, so we've got a great suggestion there to value foster care as a full and vital part of the professional team. Absolutely, well, I think we'd be behind that 100%. Um, and value as a close work in there, as Alan suggested, between the carer and school. So certainly that consistency of messages from the adults around the child in the different contexts is important. But definitely in valuing the foster carers, it certainly seems that because a lot of these interventions are delivered via carers, they are playing a very central role. And yes, Anya, so uh, that lack of view process should be helping to hold everyone to account and making sure that that consistency is there. So I think our message, which I, I I'm sure you all buy into anyway, but uh, it's just to remember that you know there are more similarities than differences between looked after children and others. So certainly we would expect some of the same assessments and interventions to work with young people in care that are used with uh, young people in the wider community. However, that there are some experiences that will be unique for being removed from your family, um, and that there is individual variation in their experiences. And also that what we might see as being a so-called problem behaviour has actually developed in, in response to living in a very dysfunctional and unpredictable family environment. These have been survival tools. We are looking at people who have developed against all odds and have developed adaptive skills. So even though it might not be something that works in the wider world, it's what's kept them alive and, and kept them going in that very harsh environment and rather than looking at that as a problem we should be seeing how we can work with that strength that they've obviously displayed to survive and to develop these skills and how we can adapt that so that they can relate to the wider world okay so i did promise you a whistle stop to do that um, so that was the nspcc review that we have we're going to move on now to helen drew's work but as i said if you've got any uh, questions or comments, do keep, keep sending them in by the chat box um, and we'll cover those when we post this up online within the next week. Thank you, Nikki. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about two aspects of a research project that I'm working on, which is um, focused on supporting the mental health of looked after children um, across the primary to secondary school transition years. So not just the immediate transition years, either side uh, of the upper primary and lower secondary, but we're looking quite broadly, so from year six following through to the GCSE years as well, and to see how we can best support um, the mental health in the school setting. So the reason why we're focusing on the transition period, well, there's lots of reasons. Um, the largest group of looked after children is currently in the 10 to 15 year old age group. And there are a number of reasons why transition can be a challenging time, not only for all children, but particularly for many looked after children. Um, so the fact that they often have lower academic attainment, uh, behavioral difficulties, are more likely to have had experiences with bullying um, and um, special educational needs. And also we know have some problems with many children maintaining or developing friendships which are crucial at this time, those things can all impact on, on in terms of making the transition a hard time for looked after children. And it's the early secondary school years as well that we know are the period of highest risk for the development of mental health problems. And we've been doing a lot of work with the virtual schools for looked after children and they've told us about many children who appear to be coping quite well in the school setting at the upper primary years but then find it very difficult once they've made that transition into secondary school. And we can also see that there's a, a significant dip, a further dip in attainment between key stage two, messages in brackets, and key stage four, um, particularly for those looked after children who've got special educational need. And two thirds of looked after children are, are classed currently as having a, a special educational need. And given that a lot of these are behavioral emotional and social difficulties can see how impacting that wider well-being can have an impact also educationally as well. 
Well, I said to Anne, uh, I, I presume that a lot of you are aware of, of a virtual school, so I'm going to talk quite quickly, but um, we've been working on this project with virtual schools who have now been set up in every local authority uh, to track, looked after children's educational attainment and um, as if they were all within a single school in that local authority. And it, the role of the virtual school head has, has become statutory now. And they also manage the pupil premium plus budget. So virtual schools and virtual school heads are well placed uh, to have quite an impact on the sort of ordinary care, like Nikki was talking about, the daily lives of, of many looked after children, particularly in school settings. So we were interested in finding out what virtual schools were doing, particularly as, as many of them are in their infancy in some local authorities. And so we developed um, an online survey um, which was sent out to all virtual schools across the country. Um, we ended up getting 29 completed surveys for about a one in five response rate. And we asked the looked after schools to describe training and services that they were providing to children and foster carers and schools, particularly thinking across the transition years. Again, that sort of broad definition of the transition years. And we were also interested in seeing, did they do did they do work around the sort of education more broadly? So looking at sort of things that might impact on education through well-being. So did they see some of their services as supporting behaviour, mental health, social and emotional understanding, attachment, and so on? So, so they were asked to kind of describe not only the service, but say what areas they felt that, that work supported so that we could get this broader picture. Well, four key themes have emerged really from the responses um, in terms of the services that are provided. Some definitely, and, and the broadest thrust of their work is to enhance learning, educational learning opportunities. I'm not going to talk so much about that um, this afternoon. Um, there's specific support for transition, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, which again, it was definitely broader than just focused on educational attainment. And raising awareness of the issues of looked after children and working with lots of different um, professionals in order to do that was very clear and very strong message that came out. And they also do a lot of work around supporting well-being and relationships. And I want to talk about that particularly um, this afternoon as well. So in terms of specific support for transition, um, again, linking to, to what Nikki was saying, it's very much that they were enhancing that kind of ordinary care, so building on what schools were often already providing. So many virtual schools are providing sort of enhanced transition support, visiting schools with looked after children and carers, some were running transition workshops, some employed a transition mentor who could work with the looked after child carers and schools from their primary school across to their secondary school provision, or they had a caseworker approach to doing this and didn't always call them transition mentors. Um, there were often extra pets so, uh, take, uh, prior to transition, so ensuring that things were in place, and some virtual schools were prioritising looked after children at this time particularly for EP or CAMS assessment. And some also ran other specific provision like transition holiday camps um, in the summer holidays for year sixes to build confidence and social skills. Um, so there was a real quite a diverse uh, provision there. In terms of well-being and relationships, we found that virtual schools were working at many different levels. And again, the provision varies a great deal between virtual schools. Um, there was quite a few virtual schools who were working at the whole school or multi-agency level in terms of providing training or development days, um, some of which were for foster carers um, and school staff and other staff, some that were particularly um, for professional staff. It, it varied a lot, but they were often focused on building awareness of the issues of attachment and early trauma on, on how that would impact on on how looked after children coped in school settings. Um, some virtual schools also provided nurture groups or small group work, which they clearly saw as supporting peer relationships and behaviour, um, rather than, again, rather than educational attainment. So just sort of picking up really on what Nikki was saying about how it's very important that in terms of developing relationships has been very key. 
and the same to a mentoring and one-to-one -one caseworker support was one of the most common provisions um, across the virtual schools and again some of the virtual schools actually used the word consistency that it was a, they were able through that to, to, to provide a positive relationship with, with that with a looked after child and that that same person could often be with them and, and still there to support them across a, 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 cha a period where there was a lot of change. And some virtual schools provided a bit more specific mental health support. So one virtual school was running Dippy's Friends, which was a positive mental health after school provision, which went on for nearly half a year. Um, an another was using their pupil premium plus money to fund interventions such as drama therapy, counselling services and so on. Another was using it to uh, provide space to reflect, which was a support service for challenging behaviour. Um, Ten virtual schools employed at least one part-time EP, some, some more, and two had employed a part-time CAMS or primary mental health worker. And there were others where, although they didn't employ those staff directly, they were based within multi-agency teams. In a few cases, the virtual school head was had another role, maybe an EP in one case, and so they were able to sort of draw on the expertise around them from these other services uh, to get rapid assessments and response for looked after children um, when needed. Um, Yes, and I mean all of this survey work, Nikki just reminded me, will 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 be going online. So what we've done is developed quite detailed provision maps of what each virtual school provides, and many of them have kindly said that we can provide their details so that they can share um, good practice and see what each other are doing. Because they've very definitely found there is no one model of a virtual school. They vary greatly. Um, but it's been interesting to see what they are doing in different areas to support looked after children. Um, come back to that with some questions at the end. Um, but I just wanted to speak briefly about another aspect of this study in terms of supporting mental health across the transition, which is our longitudinal study in schools where we're going to, uh, we are tracking looked after children and uh, matched classmates or classmates of the same age and gender, beginning with looked after children in year six, year seven and year eight currently and tracking them, those three cohorts across three school years so that we can um, obtain measures of their well-being and so on across quite a large uh, span of time from year six to year ten uh, across all three cohorts and we're particularly looking uh, this idea of early intervention in the school setting by trying to find out what are the key factors that predict those children who will develop difficulties, mental health difficulties, beyond that transition period from primary to secondary. And are there some children where there are protective factors, maybe positive peer relationships or elements of social understanding that are protecting them from developing or worsening mental health? difficulties in this period and and the aim being from this work is to develop a screening tool that can be used actually in the school setting to try and uh, screen for those children who are most at risk um, of these later mental health problems based on, based on our findings and it's because we know that many looked after children would like to access mental health support in more familiar settings that they often see and name teachers as, as sources of support, but there's currently little or no screening done of mental health needs of children in this in the school setting. So it's, uh, it's to try and address that. We are going to be the online survey or paper surveys that they complete have are aimed to develop our understanding of their peer relationships, their social and emotional understanding, empathy, pro-social behaviour, how they see themselves. Uh, and move. So we're we're using the SDQs that Nikki talked about, strength and difficulties questionnaire. And we also so we're we're also we're asking the child to complete the strength and difficulties questionnaire as one of the questionnaires they complete. But we will also have the carers um, strength and difficulties questionnaires from the local authority and teachers will also be completing that. So we'll, we'll be able to get that um, picture that Nikki said from um, many different people. We're also looking in the, in the children questionnaires at social and community engagement. 
So we're asking that plastic children and their peers, how often they do different things, how often they see their friends, how engaged they are with clubs and things like that, to see if some of those factors might be protective, as well as asking about how supported they feel by key adults, whether they're people that they tell things to, whether they are encouraged by people, whether somebody shows an interest in their achievements and those sorts of things. Um, the teachers as well are not only completing the SDQ, we're also going to ask them to complete a scale that was developed at the University of Sussex um, called the Mulberry Bush Emotional and Social Development Scale, which again um, measures sort of social engagement and well-being. And virtual schools will, will be giving us information uh, about sort of number of placements, length of time in care, and so on. So we're going to try and build up quite a clear picture, hopefully, of those factors that are risk factors related to mental health problems, and those factors that may be may be protective. So I feel like I've raced through that slightly, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just wanted to sort of throw these questions open for discussion really. I mean, I know you're all coming from different backgrounds um, and I just wondered how you feel we could develop more effective mental health support for looked after children, particularly in school settings, and how schools and carers might work together uh, effectively to intervene to support the mental health of looked after children. So it, it seems from the questionnaires with the virtual schools that there were some provision, particularly mentoring, for example, where the mentors were working with, um, with the family, the looked after child and the school, but then there were other kind of provision which was more focused on foster carers or more focused on school staff. Um, so it wasn't always clear how those two were being brought together. So um, I'd sort of like to throw that out there really. I think while, while everyone is uh, typing in their responses here yeah. as well. I think another thing to just really stress is that with the work Helen is doing and the screening tool that she's developing with the schools, it's very much about that idea of early identification. Mm. So what what you're not developing here, and correct me if I'm wrong, mm. is you're not trying to develop a new questionnaire about anxiety no. or depression. No. But you're trying to see, okay, who, what can we look out for in children? What can schools look out for in yes. children? at an early age yes. that might indicate that once they get yes. into their teens that they might yes. have more difficulty. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's very much looking for, you know, is the child maybe isolated? Uh, are they having particular difficulties with their friendships? May, may it be their self-perception? Uh, are they not as engaged in, in, in social activities? It, it, we don't know yet what, what mm -hmm. the results are going to be, but it is very much looking for those everyday kind of factors that may accumulate to uh, make that child more at risk of a related mental health problem. And so, yes, yeah, so that schools can look at something very early on. So this would be something that could be would be used in the primary setting to try and um, find those children who, who may look fine at that point, but um, uh, are, are more at risk for later mental health problems. Yeah. I'm just going to... Um, we've had quite a few responses. Yeah. I can see Alan's on fire with his okay. <laughs> So I'm just going to read a few. Foods. If schools offer best provision for looked after children, display flexibility in their induction transition arrangements that can make the virtual school head job easier in this area, and other schools are less flexible. Yeah, I've had a, quite a few comments from the virtual schools saying those sorts of things. That they certainly have better relationships with some schools than others. Uh, and also with some foster carers than others too. So there's definitely variability in both those areas. There was one virtual school that said that they provided foster carer training, but some didn't come, and, and others that have problems just getting with schools, getting basic information back from the schools too. Um, some virtual schools are employing trainee EPs using Pupil Premium Plus as a way to get significant bang for buck in supporting children. I wonder whether a similar approach with training clinical psychologists would be productive. Okay, interesting point. Mm. Yeah. When you have that online resource, Helen, let me have the link to the virtual school handbook. Yes, I will, Alan. Yeah. We've just I've just finished all the provision maps, so they're kind of the information's ready now for us to begin to put it onto that online format. Relatively few social work services share SDQ information with schools 
or encourage schools to contribute to the SDQ process. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be it would be helpful if we can see that having the teacher uh, SDQ and the care SDQ. And we know that that it's good to have it from more than one source, but yeah, mm -hmm. to raise the profile of that and the, and the use of that and the sharing of that information in schools would be useful. Noting in a way that makes you feel you have to go to get your system if you do go. Yeah. 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 Do you, sorry, Anya. Do you mean your comment about um, making you feel you have to go or that you're different if you do go? Do you mean to mental health services? Mental health support? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I was on top form in year six. Yeah. Then I had. To you had to go to a different school to your friends, which is when the issue started. That's something that's been raised um, in some of our planning group meetings as well. But that's an issue that um, looked after children because they've moved, changed foster care and placement. Perhaps they stayed in their primary school setting, but then uh, when they then when they move to secondary school, they, they they move away from their peers, and that that can be an issue. And one of the things we're asking about in the in the surveys is how often they've seen friends and things like the holidays and, and, and those sorts of things too, to get a sense of that continuity and whether no social supports are, are in place. And we'll also be able to see from the information from the virtual schools if looked after children have changed area as well. We had an ex-teacher in our therapeutic team who would go into schools do observations and help teachers understand classroom behaviour through an attachment that ends. Schools found this invaluable. Mm -hmm. We've lost this role in the closed down MTSC, but I think it'd be a great investment. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And there's some virtual schools who are um, who are doing this sort of work. So um, the development of sort of attachment friendly schools. I think it was Bath Spa University is developing mm -hmm. that, um, and there was another area in Sunderland where. And setting up a website using working collaboratively with Sunderland University as well, supporting um, understanding of attachment in schools. And I know that in the East Sussex area, they use the Thrive approach, which again is, is understanding a development and um, an emotional understanding. And that's and they can they also will train up school staff in that approach too. So similar sorts of things are happening in, in other areas. Okay, yeah. So often training for foster carers is based on local authority carers. More needs to be done for independent agency carers. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think Alan's picked up on that. Yeah. But independent fostering agencies are an interesting challenge for virtual school heads as they sometimes have their own education support. Better virtual school heads make sure training invitations go to all carers of their children. I think that's very important. It's inclusive um, in that way. Mm -hmm. I hear positive things about some schools that seek to develop an emotionally healthy school environment rather than focusing on intervention aimed at mental kids. Your words, not mine, I suggest. I think you mean Bonnie as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've had some good discussion there actually yeah. around the, the different questions that we were interested in. And it's certainly something that the work, both Helen's work at through Sussex and Surrey and our work at the Reef Centre is, is continuing to focus on is this idea of mental health. Because although we are the Reef Centre for Research in Fostering and Education, one thing we know for sure is that education to a large extent for looked after children in particular depends on their emotional well-being and that we can't expect young people to engage in their schooling um, without actually feeling safe and secure um, when they get to school mm. and knowing where they're going to be living at the end of the day and knowing that they have a good relationship with the people that they're living with yeah. and not worrying about their birth families back at home. So we're we are currently doing a, a, another study which is about educational outcomes, but in fact a lot of what's coming out from our interviews with young people is about exactly how much those educational outcomes are being influenced by their 
mental health and emotional well-being. Mm -hmm. So it is certainly a central focus for us. The discussion questions we've put up here during the session today are certainly not ones which we have the right answers for. They're ones that we think um, need a lot more discussion. We're pleased to be continuing to work with a number of different agencies, including NSPCC, who are further developing their work looked after, sorry, looked after children in local authorities, but also with independent fostering agencies as well. Um, and we're very interested every time a new report comes out about training for carers or targeted interventions for mental health and well-being in looked after children. It is a discussion that we hope you'll carry on with us. So certainly once we put this information up online within the next seven days or so, um, we hope that you'll take a look at it and comment on it. Um, please feel free to download the recording of the session as well today. Um, I think that's we've yep. covered all the information that we had um, available here. Um, we just wanted to let you know how you can get in touch with us and how you can keep an eye on the work that's going on in the recenter, but I should say that we are also being uh, continually updated by Helen on her work there at Sussex as well. That's quite a close link that we have. So please do get involved with our work, comment on our work. Um, we actually also have we also have um, reviews that we continue to write. If you want to be a, a someone who comments on our reviews that we write, if you want to have a read through them prior to publication and tell us how they fit in with your experience, we would really welcome that. If you want to write for our blog, then again, we would welcome that. And we think we've got a really good range of roles involved in today's session, which would be fantastic to get your views represented. So we'd just like to thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon. And yes, one final plug there from Anya, who uh, is just saying that the NICE attachment guidelines are currently out for consultation just for about the next week and a half, I think. So if you Google NICE attachment guidelines, um, you should be able to get the link there. Otherwise, we can put it up as a link on with this uh, recording later. So thanks, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.